understanding of a Christian posture. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, the things that we hold to, the things that uh, we uh, condition our lives for. And as we've been looking at this, it's, it's a fascinating study. It, it's one of those that even as a new convert, I read through the book of Hebrews, and it began to jump out at me. Let us, let us, let us. And uh, I don't know that in the uh, understanding of these, that one is more than another. I believe the apostle is building a case. And in that case he's building, I don't know that the first is any less or more important than the last. But that the thought there is that these are choices of the will. We make decisions concerning our Christian posture, attitude, direction that we're going to take on. These are not just for the gifted. They're not just for the special. They're not just for people who have a title. These are for all Christians, and uh, they will equip us for the supernatural path that we need to walk on as believers in Jesus Christ. And so, uh, without these, they'll greatly hinder our life. We looked at let us fear, and uh, that you know, have a have a reverence and a holy feeling towards God will will greatly affect your life, that uh, it'll affect what you do, how you do, what you, and what you don't. Are there any, any questions concerning these? We've been looking at these. Okay, we want to look this morning then at holding fast our confession. Make sure I didn't have my sunglasses on for this moment. Uh, holding fast our confession. I need Hebrews 4. 14 and 15, who would get that? Terry? And then I need Hebrews 2, 17 and 18, Darlene. Hebrews 5, 5 and 6, Aiden. Hebrews 6 and verse 20, Helene. Genesis 14, 18 and 19, Nelson. Uh, Two more, Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. Uh, Jeremy, and Hebrews 9, yeah, Hebrews 9, I'm sorry, I, Nina, I'm sorry, Nina, would you get Hebrews 9, 11 through 14, and uh, we look at this, and so the let us that we're going to look at is let us hold fast our confession, Hebrews 4, 14 and 15. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so this term, hold fast, it literally means uh, the thoughts of to get a possession of, to grasp or tightly to take and be the master to obtain, to keep, to be faithful to, not to disregard or discard or let go. And so the thought here is, let us hold on to something. Let us have that. You know, the old expression that people used to say is, well, I'm open-minded. The problem with some open-minded people is they're so open-minded, their brains leaked out that they can't, they don't, they, they don't believe anything, that everything is lost to them. As uh, it's a very interesting conspiracy theorists, I was reading a thing on people who believe conspiracy, and, and I'm not talking about the occasional I wonder what happened there kind of moment. I'm talking about they believe it. They also have the tendency to believe the exact opposite of the theory they believe in, and they'll say that could be true too. And they did this especially with Diana. Princess Diana, when she died in the crash in Paris, 
There were conspiracy theories. The royal family had them killed. Couldn't have the princess running around with uh, a Muslim man, and so they, they took him out. They took her out. And they would say, well, the, the other conspiracy, they were doing drugs in the car, and uh, the cocaine spilt, and the, and, and the driver looked over and crashed. Oh, I believe that too. Right? They, they'll, they'll buy both ends of it. Right? Neither one have anything to do with the other, but they'll say, oh, yeah, they're, they're, they're kind of like they're wishy-washy. They're, like, they're open to all these kind of things. The Bible says let us hold fast. To grab a hold of, to obtain, to possess, to have power over, to be master or chief over some things. And our text tells us what we need to hold fast to. And we're going to look at both aspects of this. But what is the main thing that they're telling us to hold fast to? What is the main thing the author of Hebrews here telling us to hold fast to? Johnny? Confession of what, though? You're, you're close. We do have a high priest, though. Darlene? Our salvation is, is definitely what he, this is all around. And let me give you another little understanding of this. The Hebrews church kind of falling back into religion. A theme of Hebrews, another theme of Hebrews is better. Better. New Testament is better. So what in our text is he talking about? What are we to grasp on? What are we to hold fast? Make our own master. Hebrews is the where it's at, yeah. Uh, Close. Close. Alicia. And open book test. Harry, he's our high priest, son of God. Christianity is not about the teachings of Jesus as much as it is about who Jesus is. I mentioned before, all religions have their prophets, all religions have their teachings, all religions have their, uh, you know, uh, their center, their book, their whatever. And we do. We have the teachings of Jesus, and we believe that's part of But the center of Christianity is not the teachings of Jesus, it's who Jesus is. And of course, if he is the Son of God, if he is our high priest, then his teachings are important. I'm not disregarding them. But Christianity's focus is who Jesus is. And we have to hold to who he is. It's very central to the understanding of Christianity, the person of Jesus Christ. It's not a concept. Christianity is not a concept religion. It's not just teaching of some prophets or sages. All religions, most religions, will acknowledge that Jesus walked the earth but they'll call him a prophet or a teacher. And that to them, that's all he is. And Jesus is critical. Aspects of who he is in our text. He's the son of God. He's the high priest. And he's in heaven. And this is important to understand because 
The person and the ministry of Jesus has to be the center of Christianity. Be the center of your Christianity. And who and what he came to do. And all through the book of Hebrews is this theme of, yes, you had your religious teachings and you had your laws and you did those and those are good. But Jesus and what he did was better. And this is why it's important because out of that, the concept and the understanding of Christianity and holding to is we're not clinging to an idea or a doctrine. We're clinging to a living Savior. We have to master our confession. Let's think about the aspects that it talks about here. The first thing it says, we have a high priest. And it goes on to say that uh, Jesus, Son of God, passed through the heavenlies. And then it says he can sympathize with our weaknesses. He knows temptation. Yet he didn't sin. Thank God. Jesus had sinned. We're all lost. But just, just so you know that. He had his blood then wouldn't be sufficient to forgive our sins. He lived a sinless life. This becomes a major theme of the book of Hebrews. What was one of the principal reasons a, uh, the Jews would have to go to the priest? What were some of the, so, let's talk about some of the principal reasons. Or sacrifice for their sins. Very good. Jesus, not only was he the one we go to for the sacrifice, he became the sacrifice. What else? A number of times Jesus tells someone he heals to go to the priest. To Why did he tell them to go to the priest? Confess their sins would be sometimes. To declare them clean. Right? Excellent. Excellent. To declare them clean. We have a high priest that looks at us and he sympathizes with us. He knows what it's like and he, and he declares us clean. Our next let us, of course, is the next verse, which we will get to next week. Let us therefore come boldly. Right? And so, uh, the access, but we'll get to that next week. But this understanding of Jesus being the high priest was, of course, something that the Jewish believers could understand. This is what a high priest did. You took your sins, you confessed, you sacrificed, you laid your hand on the bull or the goat or whatever it was, confessing your sins with the high priest. He's the one who would declare someone with leprosy or someone uh, clean or unclean. Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Can we read that? Okay, good. Therefore it was necessary for him to be made in every respect like us, his brothers and sisters, so that he could be our merciful and faithful high priest before God. And he could offer a sacrifice that would take the sins of, his, of the people. Since himself has gone through suffering and testing, he's able to help us when we're being tested. So again, here's the thought of God helping us when we're in being tempted and being under assault, if you will. And that he was the high priest. And once a year, we know the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. And, and we'll touch on that in just a moment. But the thought of Jesus being that high priest, that before God, he took our sins and we're now clean. That was something the high priest he would do. Hebrews 5, 5 and 6. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, 
who are priests forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Melchizedek is a very interesting man in the Bible, and it says it again in Hebrews 6 in verse 20. Jesus has already gone in there for us. He has become our eternal high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek there, he, he shows up. He's from the book of Genesis. And uh, a very interesting character. We don't know that much about him. And Hebrews will tell us, and uh, we're not going to get into all of that with he had no lineage. There was never recorded lineage. He had no beginning, no, we don't know when he died or anything like that. But we do know that Abraham took and paid his tithe to Melchizedek. Genesis 14, 18 through 20. This is after the victory of rescuing the, uh, his nephew Lot. And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, and the priest of God the Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. Melchizedek blessed Abram with his blessing. Blessed be Abraham by the God Most High, creator of heaven and the earth. Blessed be God the Most High, who has defeated your enemies for you. Then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods that he had recovered. We tithe of all a tenth. Tithe simply means tenth, by the way. That's what the word in Hebrew. So anyway... Very interesting here about Melchizedek. Now, what does it tell us about Melchizedek in this text? Does anyone see the two things that Melchizedek is called? Logan? Yes. Correct. And what he forbade the kings to become. Kings got in trouble when they played. Saul did it. Got in trouble. Some others who did it. Got in trouble. The priest was not to be king. King is to hear from God. Make the laws for the people. Priest is to hear from people, intercede for them to God. So they were not to be the same. That would become a very difficult place for anyone to be. So they weren't to do that. The priests intercede, the people come, they intercede for God, to God for them to bring, to hear from God, bring the laws, and the, and the conduct was acceptable. In the text, Melchizedek is both. And the only other person in all the Word of God is Jesus. We know that in the millennium and such, and again, this is doctrine you can work through on your, your own because I don't want to go down this rabbit hole right now. But we will be, in Gen Revelation 1.5, we will be his kings and his priests. But it doesn't say we'll be both. I don't know how that's all going to play out in society, you know, whether you'll be in government or in the church. I have no idea, but whatever it will be, or in the ecclesiastic. But that's the millennium promise for believers. And so we're not to be both. Melchizedek was both, Jesus was both. And in the understanding of the Hebrew, this was something that he had no beginning, no end. He was the high priest. But what's interesting about Jesus is not only was he the high priest, he was the sacrifice. That he took himself before God. Hebrews 7, 26 and 27. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heaven. He does not need daily as those priests who to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Jesus did it once. Now, enough. 
In Catholic Mass, they will have the Eucharist. The Eucharist is they are literally sacrificing Jesus every day. That's what they do. It becomes the body of Christ and they're revisiting that. Our communion services are to remember what Jesus did, but not necessarily to have him do it all over again. The word intercession means to stand between or for. And in Hebrews it says he made intercession for us. Hebrews 9, 11 through 14. So Christ has not become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered the greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of the created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place only for all the time and secured our redemption forever. Under the old system, the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of heifer could cleanse people's bodies from the ceremonial impurity. Just think how much more the blood of Christ will purify our consciousness from sinful deeds so that we can worship the living God. For by the power of the eternal spirit, Christ offered himself to God as a perfect sacrifice for our sins. So once a year, the high priest would sacrifice a goat, go into the Holy of Holies, and offer up atonement for all the sins of the people. And they would literally have to tie a rope around, you know, a, and because if he had sin in his life, he'd fall dead and it would get to death. They couldn't go in and get him, so they had to have a rope to pull him out. Jesus went in, and they would have to do this every year. We just, our last Sunday school uh, was on the feast and how some were already fulfilled, some have yet to be fulfilled, but had all, they all have Christian New Testament parallels. And in that, we looked at the Day of Atonement. This is what the priest would do. He would make atoning for all the sins of Israel. Jesus, in heaven, there's some kind of tabernacle. In fact, many believe that Moses was taken to heaven and saw that, wrote down or memorized or whatever he did, enough to bring it back, and they built a replica of that which is in heaven. And out of that, Jesus made a sacrifice, and he only had to do it one time. He is the high priest that makes intercession. You have to hold fast to that. I'll tell you another common trait of all religion. You have to pay for it. I have to pay. I have to pray. I have to work. I have to do. I have to go. I have to do this. I have to give. I have to... And I'm paying for my sins. Jesus paid for our sins once and for all. Past, rent, past sins? Present sin. Future sin. Once and for all. Now, if you treat that poorly, and there's a scripture in Hebrews that says, those who disregard the blood of the covenant, trample on it like it's common, live their lives any way they want, says, no, it doesn't work that way. But that Jesus was, plan, uh, was the sacrifice and the high priest in intercession. Any questions to this point? Author of Hebrews, if hold to them. What the Hebrew believers were doing, going back to the law. And it is easy and sad to watch organizations digress. We're not careful. Someday our fellowship could do it too. We're not special. Digress back into religion, digress back into works, digress back into. 
just the ritualistic things of religion. That's what the Hebrews were doing. That's what we have to regard for. So the second thing it tells us to hold to in our text is that Christ has passed through the heavens. This has to do with his ascension. This has to do with the fact that he was caught up. I was reading a book recently, and it talked about that there are seven raptures in the Bible. I was fascinated by that. That there were seven different times, and they went through that, how Enoch was raptured, and how Elijah was raptured, and how Jesus was taken up, and how the church will be raptured, and then the prophets will be taken out and different times in the Bible that there were that this is going to happen. It's either happened in the past or happened in the future. We'll be uh, in the future, I believe in the very near future, raptured and such. But Jesus ascended through the heaven. In English, we're, this doesn't work like it works in most languages. In, for instance, when we learn Lithuanian, dang, danguya, dangus is the word for heaven. But it is also the word for sky. And it is also the word for space. And we say the stars hang in the space, in space, right? The moon, the planets, the sky, that's all in space. We call the blue thing with the white clouds and all of that, and sometimes dark clouds, the sky. And then heaven is, of course, where God reigns. And he lives. Such. We, we have that in English. Most languages, anything above your head is heaven. That's the way it works. The skies were heaven. The space where the sun and the moon and the stars and the planets are was heaven. And the third heaven, so when Paul says he was caught up to the third heaven, he's talking about where God's presence is. That's why he would say that. And that's important to understand because the Mormons twist that. That there's layers of heaven because Paul was caught up to the third heaven. That must mean there's all sorts of heavens. And so as long as you're sincere to your beliefs, you get into the first heaven. And I always challenge him on that, with that Hitler was sincerely believed what he was doing. Does he get to the first heaven? They said, yes. He said, you're out of your mind. Probably the most prolific mass murderer behind Joseph Stalin there was. Planet Earth. You're telling me he's going to be in heaven with me? That's insane. Life. So that's what that's talking about. And so when our author of Hebrews says that he passed from or through the heavenlies, the picture is he went up into the sky through, the, through space and is now in heaven. The, pl the plural of this. This has to do with two things. So let's get a few scriptures. Um, I need Acts chapter 1. Uh, let me just one second. You don't have this, by the way. Um, but it's Acts, Acts chapter 1. I meant to put this in and I forgot. Uh, verses 9 and 10. And then I need uh, Mark chapter 16, verse 9. Oh, who would get that? Okay, Terry. Uh, then I need Mark 16 and verse 19. Aiden? John 6 and verse 62. Alicia? Jeremy, did you want to get one? Yeah, you want, uh, would you get uh, 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22? Thank you. And I need Hebrews 9, 24 and 25, Darlene, and Hebrews 8 and verse 1. Sawyer. All right, so the fact that Jesus passed through the heavenlies. We know he was taken up. Acts chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. And when he had spoken these things while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. 
And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. And so the angels come down and say, boys, what are you doing standing here? Go tell everybody about what he just did. And so the reality of Jesus ascending, ascending up, there's a group, there was a comedian group when we were young converts called Isaac Air Freight. They were two comedians who got, became Christians and they put out a al- uh, uh, couple of comedy albums. And one was based on the last day of Jesus. There were a couple of detectives looking, noirs kind of thing, looking for uh, Jesus and to catch up to him before he's crucified and they miss him and, and uh, such. And so on their second album, they did the whole resurrection thing. Oh, we've heard he's been resurrected, and they're trying to chase around Jerusalem to find him. And they get to the Mount of Olives, just, and Jesus is standing there with the disciples, and one of them is becoming a believer, and one of them is not in in it. And uh, Jesus is taken up, and the guy's going, where's the ropes? How did they do that? Where's the, where's the straight, how, where, where did they pull it out? The other guy's going, no, no, he's the son of God, and we, you know, taken up. Tells us a couple of things which deal with again that he was a, he's been on earth able to sympathize with us. But this also has to do with his place and his authority. Where was Jesus taken to? In heaven. The right hand of the Father. We still use that term for authority and usefulness, the right hand and the right hand. That place of honor, that place of authority. That is still used in today. It actually comes out of the Bible in that concept. Jesus ascended to heaven with authority. We have to hold to fast. We don't serve a weak God. Oh, God. Help, please help. I know you you can't really help, but please. Jesus said, take authority. Right? And I know I've been there. I beg God. I've been there. But Mark 16, verse 19. So the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. Okay, and Acts, Luke, record this. Jesus, in heaven, right hand of the throne of God, authority. Jesus is unique. That's like the understatement. Mormons, again, teach that we were before, and then we were waiting in line, and then we were born. We're in heaven just waiting to be. The Greeks used to teach that you were actually two people, that you were one spirit in heaven, and the gods split you, and one half of you was male, and one half of you was female. And they would send these spirits to the earth, and your job was to find your soulmate. That's where that term comes. But the interesting thing was, you wasn't before you was born. Or you were born, I knew you, and I formed you in your mother's womb. In the Jeremiah 5, 1, 1, 5. God formed us. He didn't, it wasn't like you were waiting around in heaven, my next, my next. Right? Because you think, if they could see from heaven and knew where we would be at technology, would you really have rather been born in the 1800s? Right? Life expectancy is, you know, 50-something years old, and medicine's bad. You could die of an, a simple infection today that penicillin would cure. You'd bleed to death because they didn't have certain abilities. Uh, you know, uh, all of those kind of... Or would you wait to be born now? So it's kind of a crazy thing. But Jesus was before he was born. He's the only one who was 
John 6, verse 66, 62, rather. What then if we should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? Where he was before. He's going to ascend to heaven and be where he was before. He has authority. This is where he came from. That's important to understand because he's not making it up as he goes. A lot of life we're just making up as we go on. Right? Life happens. We're, we're making plans one day. Uh, we can have something good happen to us that changes everything. We can have something bad happen to us that changes everything. We can have just one of those days. What's the children's book? The No Good, Horrible, Rotten, Bad Day? You ever have one of those? Right? Those things happen. And we're just kind of getting through life. And, and, you know, we're making plans for, you know, the near future and sometimes the far future. But, you know, life can take you on many different paths than the plans you have. But God in heaven knows exactly what he's doing. And Jesus came from heaven. He knows, came for purpose, came for plan. He is the Son of God. And he plans to help us with the authority and the power as, as we believe him that he has over demons, all kinds of issues of life. He wants to help us. We have to hold to that. 1 Peter 3, 21 and 22. And that water is a picture of baptism, which now saves you, not by removing dirt from your body, but as a response to God from a clean conscience. Is it effective? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now Christ has gone to heaven. He is seated in a place of honor next to God. And all the angels and authorities and powers of such as authority. New King James made subject. He has authority over it. When he ascended to heaven where he was before, authority. Everything is under his authority. Do you know what Biden's doing with the economy? Do you know what they're doing? Do you know what's under God's authority? Do you know what Hoka wants to... Do you know what's under God's authority? But the doctors... Do you know what's under God's authority? Everything is under God's authority. And this is important to understand. He's seated at the right hand of God, the place of authority, dignity, and influence, making intercession for us. He's for us. We have to hold to that. Holding to our confession. Hebrews 9, 24 and 25. Christ did not enter a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven. He entered into heaven itself to appear now before God on our behalf. And he did it not to not enter and he did not enter to offer himself again and again like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an angel. So again, he didn't have to do this over but he entered in in heaven. He stood before God to intervene for you and I. You have to hold to that. Because when life does throw you curveball, when life doesn't work out the way you were planning, do you believe God still has your best interest? Do you believe that He still has authority to help us? Do you believe that He still wants the best for you? In that no good, horrible, rotten, bad, horrible day or whatever. I want to move to Australia. You don't know what I'm talking about, and you have children. Get that, and get, if you give a mouse a cookie. 
and I will use them both in counseling when I talk to your kids later. Just saying. I actually was talking with Pastor Greg about dating and, uh, and such, and I said, yeah, I mentioned if you give a mouse a cookie. He went, what? I said, you don't have that book? Oh, it's a great theological book. You need to get it. And uh, I think he has recently got it for his grandchildren. Hebrews 8 and verse 1. Here is the main point. We have a high priest who sat down in the place of honor beside the throne of the majestic God in heaven. Here is the main point. So in Hebrews, the first seven chapters, which we're involved in here, actually the, we have two more let us's and then we'll be in chapter 10. So he's setting the stage for this. And he says, you know what the main point is? Jesus, your Savior, the one we've come to worship and pray to, the one who we claim has forgiven our sins because he did. He is the main point. And as it's been said many times, in many ways and di different statements, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is Jesus. We get away from that and into all sorts of other areas. His authority, who he is, he is ascended to heaven. We're not serving a weak God. Oh, there's times of frustration. There's times where you do feel like, what? You know, you feel like Job's cousin. You know, like this is a bad day. This is a bad... I was telling Pastor Strutz, you know, uh, you know, I have two years, 1995 and 2011, that were years from hell. It was like one thing after another thing after another thing after another thing after another. And it was like, tell you what, when it turned 1996, I was a happy man. When it turned 2012, I was a happy man. I know my wife was happy, too. She's right there with me in all of them. You, you know, you just have those moments. But God knew what he was doing. And I can point to the fact that if, if 2011 didn't happen, numbers of things that were good in my life that happened after that would not have happened if I hadn't gone through the year from hell. And so this is the way life sometimes works. You look back and you go, God's in charge. May not look like that at the moment. You look back and say, God's in charge. Finally, and we'll move on in uh, just a couple more scriptures. Just, let's just get three scriptures. I need First John, I'm sorry, not First I need John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. Gospel of John, chapter 1, 1 through 3. Brian. Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 14. Alicia, and Acts chapter 9 and verse Sawyer. So the final statement that he makes is that he's God himself. He's the Son of God. That term means that he is God. He's equal to his Father. I worked for a man. He had a landscaping business. He, he was... David Consalvi was actually when I got saved, I was working with him. It was called Consalvi and Son Landscaping. The thing is, is his son was eight, eight years old. And I used to give this kid, he was, you know, as a 17, 18 year old kid, high school uh, graduate, just graduated kind of thing. And we would tease him and he, sometimes he'd go with us. Most of the time he wouldn't. You know, eight year olds don't. They say they want to work, they pick up a rake, and then every shiny object has got their attention work. So that's, that's an 8-year-old. Let's hope it's not an 18-year-old. Let's really hope it's not a 28-year-old. But, you know. But he would fire me about once a week. You're fired. <laughs> I remember one time I came into the house, because we would work out of, out of the house, and he was blowing up a balloon. I, and uh, I said, get his name offhand. I think it was Matthew. Matt? 
you're fired. And he laughed, and all the air from the balloon went down his throat. He's laughing. <laughs> and we all, it was very funny. He goes, now you're really fired. And he tried to case me out of the house and such. And the picture is the son has the authority of the father. Now, in that case, of course, he's eight years old. Human being, he doesn't. Son of God, same authority as his father. In a servant's house, the servants would be his subject. If the father told you to do something, you better do it. If the son told you to do something, you better do it. That would be the way it worked. And Jesus is the Son of God. The Jehovah Witnesses will take this scripture and put a little A in there. That he's just one of many. The Mormons will tell you that, yeah, Jesus is the Son of God, but so are we all. We're all just, you know, descendants of the Father. But that's not true. We're descendants of, Ab of, of Adam and Eve. Of Noah and Mrs. Noah, we don't know her name. You know, in heaven, there's people you want to meet. I want to meet Mrs. Noah. It's just one of those that I want to meet. But Jesus is the Son of God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through him, and nothing was created except through him. Jesus was the word in the beginning. Was with God. Was God. And just so you know, he still is. He didn't resign. Advocate. Not the stare. He's God. John chapter 1, verse 14, tells us this very thing. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He became flesh. This is the Son of God coming to earth. Emmanuel, God with us. That understanding that Jesus came from heaven Help us. You know how much God loves you? Send his son. God's love the world. Only God's son, right? We say that. But the picture should be a little bit clearer in the sense that Jesus Christ was God's rescue man. Common mark of religion. How do I work to God? Christianity. God reaching out to you. Every form of religion, you'll never make it. So, Acts chapter 9, verse 20. And immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is indeed the Son of God. So this is the Apostle Paul. Get saved in Acts chapter 9. And immediately, what is he preaching? Jesus is. He's not preaching, you know, hey, there's a better way, or, you know, you can have a better life like I did. Jesus is God. And so central to Christianity, who Jesus is. That's why he says, let us hold fast our confession. Let us hold, grasp onto that. Cling to it. Cleave to it. No matter what you go through, remember who Jesus is. That he is the Son of God. He is the one who is in heaven with authority. He is the one who made intercession for our sins. We'll hold on to that. It gives us great confidence in serving God. Any questions or comments? I tend to think that we like can't get religious like you were saying but I, I definitely have seen it where like people put their ministry above like reaching souls 
even though the point of the ministry is to reach souls. <laughs> um, and I think that that's one way that we can get like crap, even though, you know, our focus like in all of our churches is like reach souls, point them to Jesus, like conversions. That's kind of one way that I've seen our fellowship turn to religion. It, and that's the danger. It's, it's, we're not exempt, you know, as um, Pastor Strutz mentioned last night, you know, revival, Rochester was the center, the epicenter of revival for the second grade of America. And yet today, those churches have lost their way. They, they gather, though people will gather in that building this morning, go through a ritual, and in their ritual, they, they will not hold to that Jesus has authority. They will not hold that Jesus is the one who made intercession for their sin. They'll go through They may pay a little lip service to it. And, and they'll be involved and they'll say, I do this, I do that, what I, you know. That. And the danger is that that can happen to any group. And we're, uh, our fellowship is striven through discipleship to impart that. And uh, Pastor Strutz again and I have been talking, you know, uh, 40 years, you know, 40 years in this church, 50 years this year in Tucson. Pastor Warner went 50 years ago this year to Tucson. Uh, you know, Prescott just passed. Unfortunately, COVID ruined their 50-year anniversary of Pastor Mitchell going there and such. But as these churches have gone on and such, we never dreamed we'd go on this. And the fact that we're still holding is great, but what if Jesus tarries another how are we going to pass this on? How are we going to make sure that we don't become, you know, ones that allow, you know, religion to take over, righteous position to overtake personal conviction? And it can happen. It really can. So there's a grave danger. And that's why, you know, uh, I think it was Martin Luther who compared most people to a drunken and on a, on a donkey, you're either leaning one way too much or the other, right? And that's human nature. And so hopefully we keep leaning, but we keep heading forward. So, yeah, it could be a danger, all sorts of areas, and uh, driving for that. Good to get our butts kicked while spiritually speaking. Get back on. Honey? No? Scratching his head. We should make him answer a question anyway, right? Didn't you hate when a teacher did that? Like, I, I don't know. I don't even know what we're talking about. I wasn't paying attention. I was writing a note to my friend, and you want me to answer a question now? <laughs> oh, you never did that in high school? <laughs> Just saying. All right, the Lord bless you. We'll have Pastor Strutt's service at 11, at 1030. God bless you.